Okay. So welcome everyone uh, to the North Jersey Astronomical Group's uh, September meeting. We're glad that uh, you could join us. Uh, we're going to start uh, our program today, uh, tonight uh, with a presentation we like to call Astronomy Adventures. And this has become somewhat of an annual tradition where we get together and members of the club uh, share some of the interesting adventures they've had over the past uh, several months. And so uh, we're going to begin uh, with uh, one of our members, uh, the chair of our observ observ observation committee, uh, Mark Zadarsky, and he's going to show us uh, some of the interesting images he's been collecting uh, recently with his telescopes and cameras and that sort of thing. And so, uh, Mark, if you would like to uh, share your sure. screen. All right. Can I, all right. So I will let me get myself going here. Uh, let me make sure that that's there. And let me, aha. Ah, okay. Let me see. I'm beginning. Here we go. Everyone see me? See yep. the, uh, we're good. All right. So, um, this was a very different year <laughs> for all of us, I'm sure. Um, so uh, for probably for the first time in a long time, I've been able to experiment uh, doing uh, live video uh, imaging, which is it's called uh, EAA or Electronic Assisted Astronomy. Uh, essentially, um, I haven't had the time to do this sort of thing. I've had, uh, you know, uh, between the work commute and all that, uh, but having the coronavirus around, uh, you know, working remotely, uh, I was able to finally um, test the waters and, and break out. And uh, so this is what I did over the summer. Um, so we got our little star tunes here with a guy with his cat and his, and his telescope and his masks. Um, and a bunch of uh, stockpile of toilet paper there. So that, that I think everyone else can relate to that. Um, but I'll yep. start from here. <laughs> okay. Uh, so finally, some time to do EAA. And uh, as I just said before, EAA stands for Electronic Assisted Astronomy. Uh, it's also called, known as video astronomy. Um, a lot of people in the past used to call it video astronomy. It's still known by that. Uh, nowadays, it can consist of a CCD or CMOS camera and live stacking software. Uh, in the older days, they used um, closed circuit, uh, uh, what you call it, security cameras to do the same thing. Um, and they still do, uh, and they still are used for that. Um, but um, with technology advancing, you know, you're able to um, get images that are probably on par with the astrophotos you may have had 10, 12, some odd, maybe 15 years ago uh, in near real time with very little or no processing, um, which is kind of, kind of neat that you get to look at things, um, you know, instead of looking through an eyepiece, you're looking at your computer screen, but you're getting a lot more detail. Uh, so uh, I used basically two color cameras uh, this summer. Um, the uh, Attic Infinity is the one you see here on the left. Um, that's the one I've had that for probably five or six years. Uh, I used it very sparingly um, because again, no time. Uh, back then it was, uh, I wouldn't say cutting edge, but it was more uh, of, a, of a big deal when it first came out. Uh, um, but now it's been superseded, you know, two, three, four times by other cameras. But nonetheless, it was, uh, it's still a great camera, uh, especially if you're starting out. Um, here you can even see it, uh, it's stuck in the diagonal. I'm probably, a, a lot of uh, images are going to balk at that. Uh, but it's a quick and dirty way to, to do EAA the way it's set up right now. Um, but it, the only thing is it needs fast optics. So this, this has a focal reducer in there uh, and some extra length in there to bring it down to uh, bring this F10 Schmidt-Cassegrain, for instance, down to F4. 
Um, the one on the right here is uh, the ZWO 294MC. Uh, the pro version, this is the cooled version. Um, the one in the picture is actually the clubs, um, the club that we've been, Omar and I have been testing this camera back and forth. Uh, I liked it so much that I wound up getting one myself. I, I sold two of my 100 degree eyepieces to do it. Um, that's how expensive the darn thing is. Um, but uh, it, it completely delivered and I'm very happy with it. And I'm still, um, I'm still learning how to use it. I'm by no means uh, an advanced imager by any sense of the word. I'm just uh, out enjoying myself here. Um, so we'll go to the, <clears throat> so the, I used um, four telescopes. Um, the first one on the upper right over here, I don't know if you can see if you move your uh, pictures of everyone over to the side. Um, there's a Mead uh, eight inch Schmidt Newtonian. Uh, I no longer have that scope, uh, but it was a great scope to start out with because um, it was native F4 to begin with. Um, I kind of regret getting rid of it. It produced really good, uh, nice images that were kind of flat. Um, yeah, it was uh, the only different, the only bad thing about it was the bulk. Um, but I learned, uh, I finally figured out the right spacing configuration. Uh, and you can see in the middle over here, um, it, it's hooked up to, uh, my eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain. And uh, after I reduced that to F4, it essentially produced nearly the same image. Um, and, uh, and so I let that, that scope go um, to you know, fund some of the other camera projects uh, that are going on here. Um, you can, here you can see the, the C11 uh, also works with that camera at F4. Uh, and believe it or not, now, a lot of guys will balk at this. Uh, my 14 inch go to Dobsonian worked very well uh, with that Attic Infi Infinity camera. Um, that's mostly also because of the, um, the focuser. It has built in extension tubes to begin with. Uh, so you can um, bring it right down to the right um, length. Uh, so the camera chip will come to focus. Uh, so you can use it visually or astro, uh, for astrophotography, which was a nice, uh, a nice approach there. Um, the C11, um, I also used uh, with the, again with the Attic Infinity, but I also used it uh, with both 294s, both mine and the clubs. Um, the 294, I will soon experiment with the other two, uh, the other two telescopes as well. But right now, for the most part, I've been uh, using it at F11, uh, F10 rather, and F6.3. Um, and obviously the faster the, the optics, the quicker the image acquisition, the lower the power and wider the field. Um, but it also uh, helps with image scale. So if you have a small, tiny object, it might be better to have more focal length. Um, so it frames it better. And you'll see that in a, in a minute here. <clears throat> So uh, my first light, this was the Schmidt Newtonian. Um, that's uh, M81 on the left. Uh, and so I took 25 second exposure. So the camera led stayed open for 25 seconds. Uh, and there are 200 stacks, which means there are 25, uh, two, uh, 200 of these 25 second exposures, one stacked up on top of the other. So that's a cumulative uh, it's it's almost the same as keeping the shutter open, uh, but you don't have all the guiding errors, uh, so you don't need to have a, a guide scope on this telescope uh, because of that. Uh, I also was able to get uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy and uh, M82. Um, this was uh, thanks to Joe Sardina. Um, this I overexposed on purpose here later on to bring out the supernova a little bit more, but this is uh, M61, it's a galaxy, uh, it's not in the sky now, I think it's in Virgo, uh, but there was a supernova in early, late April, early May of this year, and uh, I was able to pick that up, and that was one of the exciting moments of, uh, <laughs> of the early, the late spring and early summer for me. Um, 
Also did uh, the Beehive Cluster, which wasn't framed very well because uh, it was too much focal length here. Um, the Sombrero Galaxy came out nicer. And that one, you, you can see from that, it needs more focal length. Uh, it's, it's kind of small in this picture. Uh, and then there's a M87. This is the one that um, they took the, the image of the, uh, the, the silhouette of the black hole. Uh, that's that galaxy. And, it's, and there's a few other galaxies. And this is, again, this is in the Virgo area. So there's a lot of galaxies in the late spring. Uh, so now this is with the 14-inch Dobsonian. Uh, again, this was the Attic Infinity. Um, and it was at f2.9. Um, so in, in order to get it so this, basically, this was imaging uh, extremely fast. Um, it was not f2, it was f2.9. F, f but I was using uh, an MFR, uh, an MFR3 Mallencam reducer in the Attic Infinity camera with uh, uh, extra length in there to, to get it down to f2.9. And I was actually, you know, it's just experimenting and actually rather surprised. Uh, M100 is a very dim galaxy. And uh, what took, uh, you know, since 10 seconds, uh, you know, I only stacked it twice. I got a much dimmer image with the eight inch at F4, um, taking exposures, you know, stacked all, you know, together five minutes at a time. And this did it, you know, second, you know, 20 seconds worth of exposure. Um, yes, it's a large, much larger optic too. Um, M3, uh, one four second exposure that was not stacked at all. Uh, and M51, um, this was uh, 10 seconds and this was essentially one minute stacked six times. And that's what it came up with, uh, which was, you know, not bad. Over here, you can see some amp glow uh, and some, um, uh, some background noise uh, with the camera and the infinity. Infinity is not cool. So you'll see some of that, especially on the warmer nights. Um, so uh, this was during one of our broadcasts with Kevin, myself and Omar. <clears throat> I uh, took it out of my deck and yes, the computer is sitting there on the barbecue grill. Uh, the attic infinity is sitting there in the in a C8. So, um, at, at F4, and uh, and again, really good results. So was able, we were able to look at the moon. Uh, we were able to look at uh, M13. Uh, this was also uh, 51, and uh, M57 came out rather nice with a clear night. With uh, we could even see the central star. Now you try to look at this stuff with an eyepiece through an eight-inch telescope, and it, it's going to look very dim. Uh, obviously, the moon won't look like this, but all of these objects will look very dim and diffuse. And so um, this was another uh, event. This was the uh, July 18th. This was Comet Neowise. Uh, I met Kevin at um, Riker Hill Art Park, uh, and we actually did a broadcast here really quickly. We, <clears throat> we, um, you know, this is a still frame, but we did maybe 10 minutes of, uh, of a broadcast here. So it's on our, our NJAG YouTube page, NJAG Online. You can actually see uh, the comet uh, through the telescope there. Uh, and this was in the Northwest sky. It was very low. Um, <clears throat> the only, the, the, uh, the uh, the broadcast was so well, only ten minutes because people started showing up, and with the coronavirus, it was um, a little bit worrisome. So we kind of got out of there pretty quickly. Uh, so this was with the C11, and so this is the same thing at f4, once again, but with more aperture and um, you know learning how to work with the the histogram inside the um, inside the software, you start be able to get better results. So this is the uh, Omega slash Swan Nebula, depending on who you ask. Um, and this is uh, M27. Now I want you to look at this image of M27. This is through the Attic Infinity at F4 in the same C11. Uh, you'll see it again with the 294 um, very shortly. <clears throat> 
and I want you to note, take note of the difference between this image and that one. <clears throat> so um, we started experimenting with the 294. Uh, this one here, I think, was with the club camera. Um, well, some of them are. These two are M3 and uh, uh, sorry, M15 and M13 uh, were with the club camera. And you can see how many more stars were resolved down to the core. Um, ASI Live, the live video stacking software, um, will allow you to even do planets, um, although you really can't stack them uh, and you have to get the exposures really, really, really short in order to, um, to, to view any kind of planets. Uh, same with the moon. <clears throat> so this was uh, the very end of um, August, it may have been September uh, 5th. So this is the uh, early, late August going to early September. Uh, and this you can see right here, this is M27. Um, I think this was with my camera, but um, the difference between this M27 and that M27 from the infinity, this is in the same telescope. Um, same filters too. They were both had uh, astronomic um, UHC filters, uh, but the amount of detail um, that you can get out of this camera, and this is the same camera the club has in the C14 that will be in Jenny Jump. So you, if you um, want to use the club uh, observatory next year after we we will do a course and and get you guys qualified. You'll be able to, you know, take some of these images and 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 uh, if you have a thumb drive, you can take them and, and take them home with you, um, which would be pretty amazing. Um, so this is uh, an eleven inch. Uh, just Mark, imagine. Yes. Um, Jeff asked, did ask about filters. Was that the only yeah. filters you used? The UH, UHC. Uh, the astronomic uh, UHC was the one I mostly used. Uh, and some of the earlier ones, I used a. Um, uh, two of them actually. We used a um, uh, an Orion uh, Sky Glow um, imaging filter, which didn't produce that great results. Uh, and uh, but we also did a um, uh, what you call it? Uh, God, I can't think of it. Hold on, let me open my case here. <laughs> it's right here. Having a senior moment. Uh, Lumicon. Uh, deep sky filter. And so that's a broadband filter. And the UHC is a, um, a uh, more narrow band filter. It's, it's not quite a line filter, but um, so this was with, um, this was more narrow band um, than, than broadband. Um, with the crescent nebula up top there, <clears throat> which is, again was the UHC filter, uh, <clears throat> I if I plugged an oxygen three in there, you might might get more of the uh, oxygen three gas towards the center uh, that you're kind of not seeing there. So you're only seeing the outside of, of the crescent nebula, the one on the top. And uh, that's the Omega Nebula. Yet again, you want to compare it to Yadic Infinity, which didn't do a bad job, um, but you can see the difference in the detail um, with uh, with the CWO 294 and the exposure time was a lot less, even though <clears throat> the telescope was at F 6.3 instead of F4, the camera chip is uh, much more sensitive. So, um, so that was um, mostly, you know, most of what I, you know, my, my summer was like, I'm, I'm by no means uh, an expert. I'm just dabbling with this stuff. Um, my <clears throat> my favorite image so far is M27, uh, particularly with this with this camera. I'm sure it'll be other ones. Um, the more I experiment with it, um, and again, we have more of these uh, live broadcasts on on YouTube. Uh, if we have time later, I could share them with you guys. Um, I want everyone to get a chance to talk, but. Um, we have it at NJAG online, and uh, we did a really good one 
for the Newark Museum of Art. So if you look at up the Newark Museum of Art and look up uh, uh, summer stargazing, uh, Kevin, Omar, and myself did did that one um, where Kevin did use Stellarium as a planetarium software to show where in the sky we were pointed. Uh, and so it kind of guided folks that were you know, tuning in to where the telescope was pointed. So they weren't just looking at a picture, they were getting the idea, get, kind of getting a, a, a planetarium experience at the same time they were getting uh, some kind of uh, video feed of what was going on. So uh, okay, great. yeah, if you have any questions, there's my email. And uh, I'll post this up on the IO group too um, in a, um, a PDF if anyone wants to look at it. Sure. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Mark. Sounds good. I'll stop sharing here. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so uh, next up, I believe we wanted to uh, ask Omar to uh, to show us some of his, his images, right, Omar? Yes, absolutely. Let me. Uh, oh, post participant screen sharing disabled. Why is that? I don't know because, uh, oh, you're not, okay, let me enable it. I forgot that Mark was a co-host and so he had access. I got, I turned on again, so you should be good. Okay, so let me start my presentation here. And let me move this out the way, okay. Okay, so as uh, Mark had uh, discussed, uh, you know, we have been working with uh, EAA for uh, the better part of the year. Um, I actually uh, started doing a little bit more with it uh, mid-year as I was working with some telescopes and getting some hardware uh, um, straightened out. But, um, you know, uh, during the, uh, this year, I had the opportunity to look at several CMOS cameras and um, and a lot of them were with the ZWO line. I did look at other manufacturers, but, uh, you know, we were looking at, um, you know, uh, the, two, the 224, which is more of a planetary camera. And I'm going to uh, show you some images that uh, we took with that. Um, I also had the opportunity to test out the ASI 294 MC Pro, uh, the ASI 533 MC Pro. And um, you see some of the specifications as to, you know, what these cameras are, are capable of. Um, in addition to uh, these three cameras, uh, the latest acquisition was the uh, ASI 2600 MC, which is a uh, APS-C size camera, which is one that, um, you know, I would test it on, uh, on another telescope as well. And strange thing is I sold this camera and then I bought it again. So it's kind of a, you know, back and forth thing with hardware that I, I find myself constantly doing. But um, the specifications um, are available on the ZWO website, but I will upload this information to the IO group uh, for you guys to have for future reference. Here's a quick photo of some of the equipment that I've been using. This is my family photo. Um, what you'll see here is the uh, Celestron C11 Edge, um, Rasa on the, C, on the uh, CGEM DX mount. There's an Evo there in the uh, nine and a quarter. And also uh, a Newtonian um, uh, Explore Scientific, uh, which I actually just sold um, yesterday. So replacing that with a uh, RC8 that uh, I'll be getting uh, hopefully soon. Um, the RASA has been the primary scope that I've been testing a lot of the cameras with. This is the um, RASA 11 version 2 that is sitting on the uh, HDX 110 mount, which um, right now is uh, my second uh, best mount that I have in my arsenal next to my uh, Paramount ME, but the tracking and go-tos have been stellar. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to start with the photos that we've taken with the uh, ASI 533. Here's a photo of the Crescent Nebula. This was a 15-second exposure uh, gain set at uh, 360. Uh, 17 frames uh, were stacked. We were at uh, bin one, and this was just taken last month. Um, these, most of these photos, um, with the exception of a few, which I do, I will, I will uh, point out, were taken not under stellar uh, conditions. Uh, my area, I'm in a... Um, or the late sky, it's white zone. It's you know as, just about as bad as it can get um, for being in uh, you know in the inner city next to uh, next to Patterson. You know uh, quite a bit of uh, light pollution. Um, filter that we used on this, which I didn't note here, was the uh, Astronomic uh, AUHC. And um, one of the things I want to uh, 
point out is, uh, you know, a lot of these photos, uh, you know, were taken with uh, with another uh, partner that I have, and that's Craig, who is uh, another uh, amateur astronomer. He's been doing this for years, and he's uh, took the opportunity to join us uh, today. He's from uh, Dallas, Texas. The next photo that we uh, that we had the opportunity to take, also with the uh, ASI 533, of course, is M27 dumbbell. This was a 10 second exposure, 18 frame stack at bin one. And you'll notice that um, with this particular photo at that time, I believe uh, we did apply uh, some darks. This particular app, this particular photo, I believe was taken in sharp cap. So one of the things I've been, I've had the opportunity of doing going back and forth is testing different software applications and trying to find, uh, you know, um, the shortcomings of the applications and which ones were easier to use, uh, you know, for some of, uh, you know, some of our members or some, uh, you know, users who are not too versed in, in uh, some of the uh, software that's out there. Um, SharpCap is, um, it's a little bit more involved uh, as far as um, getting your uh, exposure settings correct and, and some of the other camera settings. Uh, but um, it's actually um, it's actually uh, quite intuitive when once you start uh, learning the menu and the options and uh, grabbing uh, you know your stacked images uh, actually becomes easier as you go along. Um, here's another one that we did. Uh, this was uh, taken on uh, 824. Again, five second exposure with the ASI 533 uh, high gain. This image was 24 frame stacked you know, of M17. Um, this again, I believe was uh, the uh, AUHC filter, which uh, for me has been uh, working out uh, pretty well uh, for my area. And uh, this here was the Lagoon that we also took at the same time, 824. So you can see, I mean, uh, the, uh, the edge to edge uh, detail is, is not that bad. I mean, again, you know, dealing with some light pollution, this one right here, we did not take any dark frames. So, you know, we do see some, some greenish tint, or if you can see it down at the bottom of bottom area of, of the uh, of the frame. But again, five second exposure, simple 27 frame stack. So really short, short exposure, short stacking. And this is the type of results. This is all EAA. Nothing uh, was was processed outside of what can be done within the stacking application with some minor control in either um, hue, uh, excuse me, saturation, contrast, or brightness. But that's that's about it. And uh, here's one of Mark's favorites, uh, which is the uh, veil. And again, five second exposure, 23 frame stack taken in August. Um, this one here, I believe that I adjusted the, uh, the, co the contrast a little on this one. I did play with this photo a little bit, but not much to uh, yield uh, the results that you're seeing right now. Um, again, uh, the uh, filter on this was the AUHC filter. Um, and um, you know, EAA, the way it's, uh, it's uh, you know, meant to be seen. This is probably by far one of uh, the uh, nicest photos that, uh, that I, that I, well, uh, that I feel uh, that uh, we, we took. And this was actually, uh, um, uh, Craig and myself took this photo. And uh, this was a uh, 15 second exposure. This is NGC 7000, this is down by, um, uh, this is down by the um, by the wall there by uh, Florida, I believe, and it's uh, 57 frames stack. Uh, eight. And this was taken again last month, and I may ask Craig to unmute himself for a second, and if he can confirm on the filter. I think this was also the um, AUHC filter, but the the contrast on this was just unbelievable. Um, this was. Uh, these all, all these photos were were done with the uh, with the Rasa, by the way. So we were shooting at f two two, which I I did not note here. Moving on to the next, another camera that I uh, just uh, I had the opportunity to just try a simple planetary camera, which is the which was the uh, two twenty four MC. Um, thank you, Mark, for uh, for letting me get that. And this was. Um, taken on the C on the C11 uh, edge. Uh, this was a 2X Barlow. Don't have uh, the specifics as to what uh, what we were using in the settings. I could tell you this was ASI uh, planetary. So it's ASI cap. Um, was using a, um, a high point 2X Barlow. Um, this was a, a AVI file that we generated. I believe it was about um, 
10,000 frames, if that, maybe a little less, but, um, you know, it was aligned and stacked and auto stacker. Uh, no other manipulation was done to the photo. Um, this was taken uh, last month as well, but uh, I thought it came up, you know, good enough to, uh, you know, to, to uh, show you guys. Um, Omar, I, don't I think do... that was about uh, two milliseconds, maybe, on those okay. subs there. All right, thank you. Um, I I have never done planetary before, so this was kind of like my first stab at it, you know, playing around with Mars and Jupiter. But um, yeah, it came out. Uh, yeah, I think it came out pretty decent. Moving forward, here's one of the very first photos that um, you know we did with the ASI uh, 294 MC. This was the not. This is the non-cooled version of the camera. Uh, this was, um, you know, the Eagle Nebula. I was using this on the Evolution 9 and a quarter with a 0.63 reducer. And on this particular photo, I was using the IDAS LPS-D1 filter. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you can definitely see, I mean, there, there is some discoloration in the outer area, but, um, you know, as far as the center uh, area of Nebula goes, the contrast and the, uh, and the sharpness, um, you know, for being a non-cooled camera, um, this, was, uh, actually, uh, this was actually a nice photo. and. Um, Mark thought that, uh, you know, we should add it to the presentation. So, and I kind of agree, so. This was the uh, Triffid uh, that we took, uh, also with the same, same telescope that day, it was the, uh, on the, on the uh, same mount, Ioptron. And this was also with the uh, same filter, IDAS filter. Um, this was uh, 10 second exposure, gain uh, 360, binning 235 frame stack. And uh, this was also same day that we took the other two photos, uh, you know, M51. I do not have the, the specifications as far as what we did on the settings on this one, but uh, I can tell you that this one, uh, once it was uh, finished stacking, I did uh, work on it just a tad bit, but you can see that we were definitely dealing with, uh, with some uh, gradients here and just some, uh, you know, off color on the uh, left corner. I'm not sure if that was, uh, don't think that's sky glow, but um, or amp, excuse me, amp glow, but uh, just some, just some uh, noise that was coming into the camera at the time. This right here is the, uh, you know, this is a twofer right here. So we've got actually this is the seventy six thirty five, and uh, NGC seventy six thirty five and M fifty two, both within the same photo. This was uh, you know two ninety four as well, same setup as the other three images. Uh, gain 390, bin 2, 76 frame stack. And um, I actually posted uh, this picture on uh, on the uh, Facebook page, and there's two iterations of it. There's one that uh, which is just like this, and then one uh, where I enlarged, uh, cropped and enlarged the image to bring out the bubble just a little bit more. Um, but I thought this was actually a pretty sharp photo, um, and uh, I was excited when, uh, when we were able to take it. This was my first time seeing the bubble, so... Now, this is uh, the one photo that I have from uh, the uh, 2600 MC Pro. I, I really haven't spent too much time with this, uh, with that camera yet, but here's uh, NGC 7000. I believe on this photo we were using, uh, and Craig, you may, you may you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought we were using the uh, STC dual narrowband um, filter. Um, these were uh, 10 second uh, bin one, I believe, or bin two with 34 frame stack. Yeah, and our our um, skies, I, believe it or not, were not that good. I think. Um, no, we were. Yeah, we were dealing with clouds. Um, I no. think our SQM that night was about sixteen point nine. Very. I mean, it was no. just a bad night overall. Uh, this was no. the one good image that we that we were able to get that evening because everything else was just uh, it was it was frustrating. But when you end the night with something like this, then you know you realize that it was all worthwhile. Yeah, you know, just, just sticking to, it out. We just needed to get the green United States out of it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, and, uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, new projects, I mean, we've got uh, some new things happening here. Uh, we're going to be, uh, this is right in my backyard. Uh, I've uh, started, uh, hired a contractor and he's uh, actually laying down a deck, a uh, flat deck out in the backyard. So I can uh, have this, uh, this is a stock photo of a next dome that I'll, uh, I'm going to have uh, uh, installed back there in the uh, Paramount ME on the uh, Pier 1 tech with the uh, vibration dampening system. Um, so we've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, it's been a good year so far and I'm looking forward to the next. 
Uh, before I get into, you know, you know, if there's any questions, um, I don't know if time will allot, but if not, you can, guys can always reach out to me. My name, uh, my uh, email is available on the IO group. Uh, but uh, before I close, you know, again, I want to just bring acknowledgement to uh, to Craig Bolton and Mark Zdarsky, you know, for all their help and assistance in making this uh, possible. Because uh, you know, I speak with these guys three, four times a day, and uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, always we talk about software, cameras, telescopes, filters. Um, you know, best combinations to uh, as far as equipment and hardware and software goes to try to make this hobby as easy as possible, you know, for others. So, you know, we go through the pain so, you know, uh, we can pass on what we learn and hopefully uh, make it easy for somebody else. So thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Omar. Some really fascinating uh, uh, images there. Um, I'm going to, uh, whoops, I was just going to share my screen here. And uh, I've got a little story for you guys uh, uh, that is all about a telescope. Uh, so let me switch over to my PowerPoint here. There we go. And uh, go full, street, full screen here. Whoops, come on. There we go. So I have a little story here uh, about a telescope. Uh, I was uh, looking on Facebook uh, a, a little while ago and uh, I saw an ad for a telescope and uh, uh, it, it kind of caught my eye because the price on the telescope was really quite high. Uh, the price was $12,000, $12,345. And I thought, well, wow, that's that's really, a, a, that must be a really spectacular telescope. And I was thinking this must be a big, uh, uh, antique telescope, maybe it's an Alvin Clark or something like that, something very rare uh, and, and very special. And I opened up the ad and instead of finding a, uh, a big telescope like that, uh, I found this, this is a, a six inch refractor. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it uh, it's kind of uh, interesting, a six inch F15 uh, refractor uh, from the 19, probably around the 1960s. Uh, so it is a, an old teles older telescope, uh, but it certainly uh, is, is uh, uh, you know, kind of in, in, I wouldn't say rough condition, but it's been well used. You can see uh, that it's been well used and you can see it has some different parts. I noticed that uh, looked like some unitron parts that were part of the, the scope. Uh, I thought, you know, this uh, really kind of looks like something that one of the uh, an amateur astronomer back in the 60s would uh, would build that was a very common thing back then uh, it was back then it was cheaper to build your own and so a lot of people got into uh, building their own telescopes and uh, people still do it today but uh, it's not quite as common as it used to be uh, but uh, so I was looking at this uh, telescope it's kind of interesting and I uh, notice the uh, uh, unitron focuser. And so uh, uh, sure enough, the ad described it as uh, something built uh, by an amateur. Uh, but if you look at the focuser, this is what stood out to me. Uh, the name of the person who built it is on, uh, he had a nice little plate made and put it onto the focuser. And uh, I don't know if you can read the name. Uh, the name says Jesse Wilson. And the address that where he lived uh, is listed on there, Myers Avenue in Denville, New Jersey. And the uh, reason why that uh, stood out to me is that I live in Denville and uh, Myers Avenue is probably uh, maybe a half, maybe three quarters of a mile from my house. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. Uh, you know, this was built in, in, in Denville right here in New Jersey. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, and so, uh, but I couldn't quite figure out the price. You know, twelve thousand dollars for a six-inch telescope—that's that's kind of kind of high. Uh, so I, I sent a, a message or I made a comment on the on the ad, uh, and I mentioned, "Boy, this is a really nice uh, telescope, but uh, boy, that that's a a very high price for for a six-inch telescope or something to that effect." And so. Uh, it was interesting, but uh, I uh, kind of didn't pay too much attention to it. Uh, but uh, later, I, I got a, a, an email or, or uh, a message back from the person who posted the, the ad. And he said, oh, that's that's not the real price. You know, I just put that in there uh, as kind of a placeholder. Uh, what he did was he, and I guess this is common on Facebook, is it makes you enter a value. And so we had just entered one, two, three, four, five 
which turns out to be twelve thousand three hundred forty-five dollars. Uh, so that was not the real price. He came back and he said, "Well, what I really want for it is uh, about fifteen hundred. And I thought, "Oh, well, that's uh, much more reasonable." Uh, but it's still uh, really kind of high, and so I didn't really respond to that that uh, that message. Uh, and a little while, while later, uh, he he said, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess I, at some point I wrote back and said, well, that's uh, very nice. That's much more reasonable. Uh, I would love to bring this back to the town where it was built, but you know, uh, that's still a little bit too high. Well, eventually, about a week goes by, and he uh, uh, then comes back and says, well, you know, I was going to include a, a, another mount, uh, an Aldazimuth mount. Uh, with this telescope, but I decided that I, I want to keep that, and I'll just sell you the, the, the telescope a, as is. Uh, and so uh, that's what I ended up doing. I ended up buying this uh, telescope from him. He was up in uh, uh, Connecticut, and you can see the design. It's a, a very classic uh, amateur uh, construction uh, built out of pipe fittings. This is a very common uh, design back then, uh, very clever. Uh, it does not use any gears or bearings at all in it. Uh, it is just literally pipe fittings that are put together and the telescope turns on the threads uh, of the pipe and uh, he, so he, he this guy uh, Jesse Wilson uh, built this uh, himself he bought the parts locally uh, there was a company called Jagers out on Long Island and a lot of people in this area uh, bought parts from them uh, and telescopes from them and so he bought the lenses and some parts from them and built this uh, six inch f15 refractor and so I bought it from him and uh, I, I'm now now in the process of uh, trying to restore this. Uh, you can see it's a, a, a rather unusual contraption. Uh, he, you can see he put wheels on the bottom of it so he could roll it out into his onto his lawn. And uh, so a very uh, clever little construction uh, there. And so for, for back in the, the 60s, probably early 60s when this was built, you know, a six inch F15 refractor, that's a, a big scope. And uh, boy, yeah, the, it is an F15. It is a long telescope. Uh, the, tube is uh, over seven feet long and so it barely fit in my car <laughs> so it was pretty interesting to transport uh, so now i've got the uh, telescope back here in uh, denville and uh, i uh, got a new cradle for it so that i can uh, hopefully uh, uh, remounted a little more modern cradle for it and i'm busy uh, stripping some of the old paint off of the parts which i'll uh, eventually uh, repaint and put back together again and so uh, that was my little uh, summer project is that i've been continuing on is restoring this uh, old six inch refractor and so i'm looking forward to uh, trying this out once i get it back together again and so that was my little uh, uh, summer uh, adventure in uh, telescope uh, restoration. Uh, we also have some uh, images here I have uh, from one of our other members, uh, Adam uh, uh, Totter. Uh, he uh, has been doing some really spectacular uh, imaging. And uh, he made a summer trip uh, of his own. Uh, he went out to Cherry Springs, uh, Cherry Springs State Park, which is out in sort of central northern Pennsylvania. And uh, it's a very uh, dark area, very, uh, very nice uh, dark skies there. Uh, it's very popular with amateur astronomers to go out there. And uh, so I believe this was uh, taken in uh, August. Uh, a lot of these pictures were taken uh, in August uh, at Cherry Springs. And so the very first image here is the, the center of the heart nebula. So this is kind of a magnified view of the center here. Uh, these, uh, these, these next couple of images I'm gonna show you here were taken with Adam's telescope. Uh, he is a uh, Explorer Scientific 127 millimeter, or about five inch uh, refractor. Uh, and uh, this is a ZWO camera. Uh, it's an ASI 1600, uh, and he's got it mounted on an Orion Atlas uh, Atlas mount. And so this is the the center of the Heart Nebula. He also captured an, uh, some nice images of the Draco triplet. Uh, you've got three galaxies uh, in the constellation of Draco in the northern sky. Uh, he also uh, took a very nice uh, image of uh, the Pleiades, M45. You can really see the uh, nebulosity uh, in this particular image, really it stands out. So that's pretty, pretty neat. Uh, uh, here's uh, uh, the Triffid Nebula, which you saw, uh, or Omar had a nice uh, shot of the, the Triffid. Uh, here's uh, M20 uh, from Cherry Springs there. Uh, he also took some shots with a smaller 
um, 70 millimeter uh, telescope, which of course has a shorter focal length. Uh, and uh, he used an ASI 183 camera uh, also on the Atlas mount. Uh, this is the Tulip Nebula, the Tulip Nebula. So there's a beautiful shot. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the Heart Soul and, and Fish Head. I'm sorry, this is a, a wider view of that, that Heart Nebula. So on this side over here, there's the Heart Nebula. You can kind of see the heart shape to it. And there's the center part where we were looking at that earlier image. And then we've got um, the uh, Soul Nebula here and the, the Fish Head. So you get those three nebulas close together. So this is a uh, nice uh, wide shot of this uh, part of the sky. Uh, let's see, uh, there also should be a picture. Yeah, there's the Tulip uh, Nebula. And uh, also uh, Omar had shown a picture of the uh, Veil Nebula in Cygnus. And so he also was able to capture a part of the Veil Nebula, which is known as Pickering's Triangle, the sort of triangular shaped bit of gas uh, that's part of uh, the Veil Nebula. And so some really nice uh, shots there of uh, the sky. Uh, he also sent two images, uh, two nice time-lapse images that he took uh, at Cherry Springs. And so here you can see the, at the bottom, you can see the, uh, the campground, the, the observing field uh, there at Cherry Springs. And I believe this is uh, facing east. You can see M31, the Andromeda galaxy, rising up there. Uh, and uh, that's, let's see, is that Mars coming up, I think? There's the Pleiades rising up and there's Taurus coming up to there too as well. So a nice uh, shot there, a nice time-lapse uh, facing uh, east at Cherry Springs. Uh, here's another image. Uh, let's see, there's another time-lapse. Uh, I'm trying to remember which one this, whoops, sorry. Let me go back one and let's take a look at this. I think this is the Milky Way. Yeah, this is facing south at Cherry Springs. You can see, uh, Jupiter and Saturn. You can see the core of the Milky Way galaxy reaching up, uh, the Milky Way reaching up towards Cygnus there. So this is facing south at Cherry Springs. You can see people on the observing field there running back and forth, maintaining their telescopes. So you can see quite a few uh, planes and satellites going through this as well, as well as some clouds. So nice time lapse from Cherry Springs this summer. So very nice uh, area out there in Cherry Springs. Uh, let's see, uh, Terry, uh, Terry Bats. Uh, Terry, are you online with us? If you are with us, uh, feel free to unmute yourself. No? Okay, I thought he was gonna join us tonight uh, for this uh, meeting, but uh, there we go. Uh, oh, you're the here? Oh, great. Yeah. You're on mute. Okay, good, yeah, good. I've been listening all along. Okay, yeah. great. I, th I thought so. I was hoping you'd be there. So yeah, yeah tell, tell us a little bit about your images. This is the, the moon image that you sent. We'll start out with yeah, this one. This was this was taken with my Dobsonian 16-inch uh, F5, and I just took it as a snapshot with my phone, this phone I've got here. So, so I was pretty happy with it. Yeah. Nice. It's got galaxy optic mirror. And, uh, you know, they're very good optics. So, uh, you know, one of my projects will be to try to, you know, get this telescope to be out of track and, uh, uh, you know, it's got great potential, but that's down the road. Mm, so yeah. that's, that's the first one. Great. Okay, I believe the next one is Jupiter. Yeah, I took this of Jupiter um, last week and I'm still, you know, sort of working on, Jupiter is a lot harder to take than Saturn is, as far as I'm concerned, a lot harder to focus. Oh, and right. this particular okay. image, I decided to use my uh, 130 mil refractor because it's got the dual focusing uh, ability on it. So I, I thought I had a much better chance of getting this focusing accurate. I tried okay. some images of Jupiter before and uh, they weren't as sharp as this. And there are others out there, obviously, that are better, but it's not bad, it's, you know. Yeah, this is very nice. There's lots of detail in the uh, equatorial yeah. belts there. You can see the red spot, a little yeah. kind of hollow around the red spot there. So yeah, that's a nice shot. Thank you. Yeah. And Saturn, of course. Saturn, yeah. So you can see it's a lot easier to take Saturn. I don't know which one. There's a couple of, I think I have of Saturn. I just processed one tonight as well. Again, this one, 
with the refractor. I just decided to do that because focusing is critical to get pretty sharp images. It may be the one I took with my 8SC, but I think that's the refractor one. So. Okay. Um, yeah, I was actually pretty <laughs> pleased with this. This is uh, Neptune taken with my phone again. And uh, that was with the 8SC. And oh. uh, yeah, so I took that and uh, I was able, I took a bunch of shots as you can imagine or, or shots of it. This one, you know, was almost perfect. So yeah, I was pleased with it and the color's not nice. So I touched it up a bit with the phone, you know, editing thing, but yeah. yeah. So I only saw a Neptune for the first time about three or four days before that. So I was pretty happy about yeah. it. Yeah, that's um, a really nice, um, really nice color to Can you hear me there, Kevin? Yep. Hello. Yep, you're, we can well, hear you. You lost me? No, you're there. Okay. I just want to make a comment, if I may. Um, the reason why I was able to get this image of Neptune is because of the tracking, the tracking of the mount that I had. And I want to thank both, well, first of all, Omar and uh, Mark. Mark was the one that pointed me to Omar. My AVX was going nuts. And I go, and Mark suggested I give it to Omar. Omar pulled it apart and found a loose screw in the, in the mount. Ah and he fixed it. Otherwise, I would have had to send the mount to Celestron or somewhere, and it would have right. taken weeks and cost a fortune. So thank you very much, Omar, for doing yeah. that. It would not have been able to take some of those images without it. Uh, no, no, no worries, no worries. <laughs> yeah, great, very happy. Great. Cool. OK. Yeah. Um, so uh, so yeah, that was, last, uh, that was the last, that was the, well, that's the last slide that I have uh, for, uh, right now. Um, so, uh, was there any other images or anything, anything else that people would like to share or tell us about uh, your uh, astronomy adventures this summer and the interesting activities that you've done? Uh, feel free to, uh, Al, Al, yes. So I just have a funny story. So, um, I've been trying to thin the herd here on how many right. telescopes and Omar is well aware of how many I've moved out <laughs> over, over the past two years. But I came across something interesting that I'm just gonna share a quick story. And it relates to what you were talking about, Kevin, with coming across that six inch telescope. I came across a six inch um, Criterion RV6. Oh, nice. In boxes, little boxes of all the people right. and just the tube. The mount, everything was disassembled. I had no idea how to put one together. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I started laying out all the parts in the garage and I, and I noticed I was missing this little bolt or I was missing uh, the secondary mirror. But over the course of about five or six months starting this spring, I was able to get the whole telescope yeah. assembled. There's no missing pieces. And um, I star tested it. It looks okay. I need to collimate it still and do a little touch up to it, you know, paint and stuff. But um, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, I, I'm not a reflector guy. I don't know reflectors, um, but it was just a blast putting it together and getting all the pieces right and uh, and watching it come alive. And now it's sitting in my garage, fully intact, motor work, everything is just awesome. So, um, great. so my, my summer astronomy story. <laughs> That's great. Those old Criterion uh, telescopes are really nice. Yeah, uh, pretty cool. Really well made. Cool. Okay, any other uh, comments about uh, summer activities that they would like to share? Otherwise, we'll move on to our uh, night sky update. Okay, no? Okay. Uh, Mark, are you prepared to give our September sky update? Or I could uh, share the screen and do that. Uh, da, 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 da. Where are you? Uh, ah, okay. 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 Put this over. I guess if I can just make another comment there, Kevin, while sure. Mark's getting ready. 
the point of mentioning Omar is that if anybody out there is watching, one of the great advantages of being in a club is that when you have a problem, you have people you can talk to and ask for help. Yep. And, and sure. club members are, are always willing to help. So I just want to make that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. good comment. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's one of the beautiful things about being in a club. You, you know, you share your interests and uh, someone else has expertise that you don't have and vice versa. It, uh, you know, every, everyone wins, so to speak. Um, all right, so here we are in September. How did that happen? <laughs> Last I remembered it was March 15th and uh, here we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so meanwhile, life goes on, right? Um, so here's our, um, I shared a bunch of star charts earlier. I'm not sure if anyone has in front of them. They're welcome to print them out and whatnot, but um, I'll share this again. Uh, later on as well uh, after the meeting. Uh, so just the basics of the star chart, if anyone doesn't know, um, the, when you're looking at the star chart, the zenith is always in the center of the star chart that's directly overhead. If you're looking towards the south, like the bottom says here, you want the bottom of the chart to face, uh, you know, the south to be facing down. If you're facing the east, where my pointer is over here, you want the e turn the chart 90 degrees so the east is down, uh, and same with north and and west as well. So if anyone that you know is new to this sort of thing, uh, the part that is down, this is the horizon. The center of the chart is directly overhead, uh, so that's always good to keep uh, uh, in mind. Uh, so this star, this star chart is good for about 40 degrees north, which is about where we are. Uh, early September, it's a, it's a snapshot. It's 10, 10 p.m. Mid September, nine. Late September, eight, uh, because the stars are marching ever westward uh, as the Earth uh, goes around the sun. Uh, so our um, Late spring and early summer constellations are now setting in the west. Um, so, you know, Bootes, uh, Serpents, Caput, uh, even Ophiuchus is starting to make its way down. Uh, Scorpius is actually now setting as well. Uh, your late summer constellations are in the zenith and the south after uh, nightfall. So, you know, uh, Cygnus, uh, Lyra, um, you know, Aquila, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, Sagittarius. So these, these guys are, uh, in the South and kind of in the, in the Zenith, depending on that's considered your summer constellations when they were prime time. And so now the autumn is, you know, coming, uh, coming near and your autumn constellations are now rising in the Eastern sky. So uh, these are the usually pretty dim ones, uh, Pisces, Aries, uh, Capricornus. Um, only when you're, you're further out um, or the sky is very clear rather, and it's really tough e even with the, the smog we're getting from the, um, uh, the fires in uh, the West Coast right now. So, so these, 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 uh, these are pretty hard to spot, uh, but they are in the East. So uh, this I got from the Astronomical, uh, Astronomical League, um, where our club actually gets its insurance from. Uh, every month or so, they put out a star chart, and they, uh, they have a basic star chart. So the nice thing about that their star charts is they have a bunch of the asterisms. And these aren't exactly constellations. They're kind of a piece of a constellation that uh, forms a familiar shape that people kind of remember, like the down here in the south, the teapot. The teapot is the most, the brightest stars in Sagittarius. And those are like, you know, people look at that and they say, well, it looks like a giant teapot. Uh, the summer triangle is right overhead right now. So you have Vega in, in uh, Lyra, Deneb in um, Cygnus and Altair and Aquila the Eagle. Uh, so they form the summer triangle, they're directly overhead. You have like the keystone that's like the center chest of Hercules. Uh, but some of these bright stars are often pointer stars, like, you know, 
the um, the two star stars on the side of the great square Pegasus also kind of point to Famalahut, which is like the lonely autumn star of the uh, of the south. We'll see that in October. Um, uh, the the parts of the Big Dipper of the of the, um, the ladle, uh, the two stars there, kind of point to Polaris. Uh, the W and Cassiopeia also points to Polaris. So these are kind of your guide stars uh, that point to other things in the night sky. So our planets are pretty much front and center right now. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn have been with us uh, all summer long. Uh, they are uh, high in the south and southeast right now. Uh, Jupiter will set uh, will set before Saturn, but they are very close. Um, they are heading towards conjunction in December, um, but uh, it'll be very tough for us to spot because they'll be so low in the horizon, they'll be in the sun's glare. Um, so now is the best time to view both of them. Uh, and the imaging season is just about ending for Jupiter, I mean, another month or so uh, before it starts getting too low and you start you're too low in the atmosphere. Um, Saturn um, is, is right behind it. It's just a little bit closer to the south than, than southeast. Um, and in um, Aquarius, uh, right now you have Neptune, uh, and that's in the southeast rather than instead of the southwest. And in rising in the east right now, um, shortly after sunset is Mars. Uh, and it is going to be at opposition uh, next month. So it's going to be at our closest approach. Uh, it'll look uh, as large as it will for the next two years in a telescope. I think it's something like um, 19 arc seconds or 17 arc seconds. I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but its imaging season is, is about to peak really soon. Uh, and so same with the viewing season. Uh, and behind it uh, is Uranus uh, low in the east. You probably have to wait till about midnight to, to get to uh, high enough so you can actually um, view it uh, proper. Uh, in the morning sky, we have uh, Venus. Uh, it's low in the east. Um, right around the middle of the month, particularly the 14th, you might want to uh, bring your binoculars out there and you might be able to view it, uh, the crescent moon and the beehive cluster shortly before sun sunrise. Uh, again, you know, uh, binoculars have about a five degree field of view. So on that date will be the best date to try to view it, but you have to get up uh, really early um, before the sun, about uh, an hour and a half before the sun comes up. And uh, right now your deep sky objects are uh, pretty plentiful right now. Um, uh, your your globular clusters uh, and M13 and M92 are uh, high in the, um, uh, I would say the West at this point, but they're still pretty high up. Um, a lot of your globulars down in Ophiuchus, however, uh, are low, so you want to view them early because they will set fast. Uh, along with the Lagoon Nebula and the Trifid, everything down here by the Galactic Center, you want to kind of view that early, uh, right after, as soon as it gets really dark, because then they will proceed to set in the in the uh, in the southwest. Um, but uh, you're also going to have uh, M57 in Lyra, uh, M27 in uh, Sagitta, but it's actually if you take a, a, um, a pencil and go across the sky from Vega across uh, Alberio, and you can make almost make a straight line between Vega and M27, uh, the Dumbbell Nebula. Um, also, the Veil Nebula is right is a perfect time to view it. It's directly overhead. You have the least amount of atmosphere. Um, your uh, globular cluster M15. Uh, again, you want to, you know, when you're doing your viewing, you want to do it from west to east because everything in the west will set first. Um, uh, the Helix Nebula, you'll need a dark sky site uh, and an oxygen free filter. It's very diffuse. Um, it, the Andromeda Galaxy is becoming higher in the um, in the east at this point, uh, M33, the pinwheel, 
Uh, again, that's somewhere where you want to be in a darker sky site. That's a very diffuse object. Um, Perseus double cluster is one of uh, one of the best uh, opens to view. And if you're up late at night, the Pleiades will uh, become come in view. It'll break the um, Eastern horizon uh, around 9 p.m., but uh, you might have to wait till about midnight to get a good view of it. <clears throat> so if you look in the sky, remember we were talking about the Keystone and Hercules. Here's the Keystone, right? And kind of, you know, a lot of people um, like to view Hercules or the, the idea of Hercules is this is his head and this is his arms and this is his feet, but uh, I know I like to think of it the opposite, where this is his head and 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 this is kind of like his his shoulder, and right below his arm is his uh, is M thirteen. Um, uh, so that's that's uh, Hercules, uh, the Ring Nebula. Um, this is kind of what it would look like to a telescope, but uh, photographically it looks like uh, like this. This actually this one actually came through my fourteen inch daub uh, with that uh, EAA camera. But if you look between these two stars and Lyra, one of them, I think, uh, I think uh, Beta Lyrae, if I remember correctly, is Sheliac, if anyone's a Star Trek fan, <laughs> the Sheliac. Um, hold on a second. I just had uh, a cat problem here. Hey, what are you guys doing? Knock it off. <laughs> it wouldn't be a proper Zoom meeting unless a family pet interrupts in some way or another. Sorry about that. Yeah, we had... <laughs> Two cats just uh, started really getting into it. Battling. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just heard it in the next room. That wasn't good. That was uh, that was Bear and uh, um, and Ezzy again. I don't know. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry about that, folks. Always having a issue with a cat. Um, anyway, um, so M fifty seven is right in between these two stars here. Um. Right after that, uh, if you look again, we were talking about the Dumbbell Nebula. Um, so if you literally draw a straight line through Lyra, particularly in Vega, right through um, uh, Alberio, you'll actually re reach the Dumbbell neb Nebula. If you, it's a good way to find it with binoculars, um, but obviously it looks better through a telescope. Um, the the Veil Nebula is kind of right in the wings of uh, Cygnus over here. So if you look through these two stars and go down right right directly in the middle and just go right down there, you'll find the uh, Eastern and Western Veil Nebula. And again, that's directly overhead. And this is a supernova remnant, uh, I believe 6,000 years old. Don't cor uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's 6,000 years of age. <clears throat> Um, Ophiuchus, again, uh, loaded with globular clusters. Uh, M5 might be too low now, but uh, M10 and M12 are uh, still visible. And uh, the center, the galactic center, uh, there is a myriad of objects here if you're looking at your star chart. But um, this wide field image, you have, you know, the, the Eagle, Eagle Nebula, uh, the Omega, which is also known as the Swan, uh, the Trifid, the Lagoon, there's various uh, open clusters and um, uh, globular is also in this region as well. Um, so uh, yeah, this stuff down here is gonna be too, too low to the horizon for our latitude um, to view. Um, M15, uh, real quick. So again, if you're in the great square of Pegasus and you come down off one of the, the legs and right by the star uh, Enif, the bright star here, you can find, gets you right off to M15. Um, Andromeda, my favorite way to look uh, look for Andromeda is the W and Cassiopeia. Uh, Cassiopeia, just go off of Skadar over here and go directly off you know, from this, this kind of point to the to M31. Perseus double cluster, right? This is one of the last ones. So again, here's Skidar it was pointing towards M31 if you're looking this way. Uh, and it's kind of in this orientation now in the sky. If you go down this way, 
with your binoculars, you'll find the, the Perseus double cluster. And um, these are, this is open, uh, two open clusters of stars rather. Uh, and um, there's a lot of, uh, lot of interesting um, things to see in these two. And these are young stars. They are, they've used up their stellar gas and they're spreading out, uh, dissipating. Uh, so one last thing uh, before I go uh, and sign off. Um, the, uh, the AAR 16 inch uh, is now uh, being uh, taken care of by Ed Gunther. He's uh, from the Adirondack Astronomy Retreat. He's right out of SUNY Plattsburgh. And uh, he shared his picture with it. Uh, he bought a, uh, what you call it, a scope buggy for it. So now he doesn't have to worry about breaking his back and moving the telescope. It's become too big. but. That telescope now has wheels. So um, this was a telescope that uh, NJAG used for a little while uh, at some of our outreach events. Uh, again, uh, David Levy, uh, it was donated to the Adirondack Retreat and David Levy um, let us use it, uh, but uh, it became too big and heavy to, to carry around. Uh, so <laughs> apparently uh, uh, it's getting contagious and uh, it's finally got a set of wheels and makes it easier to move around. So uh, I think that's it for me. I'm going to stop sharing and we'll move on to what's next here. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Mark. Uh, great uh, update there. Uh, this uh, concludes the broadcast uh, portion of our meeting. And for those of you watching online, we want to thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, for our members, uh, please hang on. We do have a short uh, business meeting. We've got a couple of uh, pieces of business to take care of and some uh, uh, events, to, to upcoming events to, to talk about. So please stay online. Uh, for the rest of you, uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, just a reminder that our next meeting is going to be on October 14th. Uh, the NJAG always meets on the second Wednesday of the month. And so uh, October 14th, we have uh, a guest speaker, uh, Chris Morrow, one of our own members here at NJAG. We'll be talking about New Jersey's favorite astronaut, uh, Buzz Aldrin, uh, otherwise uh, known in certain circles as Dr. Rendezvous, and he'll explain what that means uh, next month. So please uh, feel free uh, to join us then.